Hello, very warm welcome. You're watching Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Now, there is plenty that is new in this new year. New peaks of infection rates from COVID-19 in some member states, but also new COVID vaccines getting authorization for use in Europe and elsewhere. There's also a brand new relationship between the EU and the United Kingdom with us today on the programme as we try to work out what this newness will all bring to the year 2021. We have France's former Europe Minister, Nathalie Loiseau, who's now a member of the European Parliament for Emmanuel Macron's party and chair of the Parliament's subcommittee on security and defence. One of the key questions uh, involved in Brexit, which we'll come to, Nathalie Loiseau, thanks for being with us. A pleasure. Um, before I come to all of that, though, I would like to start off with events uh, in the United States in the last few days, uh, received with shock around the world, including here in Europe. Um, as we know, on Wednesday, uh, supporters of Donald Trump broke into the Capitol building. Uh, there was violence. There have been deaths. The US president told his supporters that he loves them. Uh, we can hear what the French president had to say among much reaction here in Europe to express our friendship and our faith in the United States. What happened today in Washington, D.C. is not America, definitely. We believe in the strength of our democracies. We believe in the strength of American democracy. Uh, Nathalie Loiseau, there's been uh, criticism and condemnation of the, the violence across the board from European leaders. But a lot of what we heard from Emmanuel Macron there, this sort of, you know, United States is our friend, it's our ally. Uh, but at the same time, these leaders have perhaps not called out Donald Trump very forcefully in the past, past for his attacks on democracy, his support for white supremacists sometimes. Uh, I think that what took place uh, is not a surprise. It's a shock, but it's not a surprise. Uh, and it's not specific to Donald Trump or the United States. Uh, there is another pandemic. It's not only COVID-19. It's also this pandemic of populism, of authoritarianism, of um, threats against democracies. We have to defend our democracies. We, ha don't, we should not take for granted that democracies are forever. They are threatened. They are under attack disinformation, cyber attacks, this violent uh, moves against a parliament, uh, it should be a wake-up call for all of us. Well, has Europe, though, uh, spoken out clearly enough against some of these attacks that have been pretty overt from Donald Trump himself and from the White House on American democracy? Um, I don't know if we were outspoken enough. I think that uh, the trouble we are in now is that we still behave uh, in a polite manner with some leaders who don't play by the rules. And at some point, we have to realize that we have to be heard. Mm. We have to act and to speak louder. Uh, this is necessary. But I would also add that the responsibility of uh, the big internet players, the social media, mm. is huge. Uh, the uh, rioters in D.C., these Quanon uh, guys, they talked together on social media. They organized themselves on mm -hmm. social media. So it's a little bit uh, late that uh, Facebook decides to uh, suspend the account of the president. And I don't like a private company taking this sort of decision. Mm. But what have they done or, or what have they refused to do? for years. Now, one really uh, important and significant aspect of Europe's relationship with the United States is defence. We know that there are thousands of American troops stationed here in Europe. It is very, very important to certain member states to have uh, NATO support, and a lot of that is from the United States. Is it time to reevaluate that European reliance on the US? Uh, it is time that the European pillar of NATO becomes more relevant that we don't uh, sleep and think that we can outsource our security and our defense 100% to our American ally. Mm. Uh, an eye alliance means that there is a strong European partner. This is the reason why people like me and others are pushing for more European defense and are making steady progress in this direction. So remain part of NATO, but 
create some separate European defence structure alongside that? Yes, uh, and it's, it complements NATO, and there are uh, issues on which we have to be autonomous. Mm. A strategic autonomy uh, can be defined as uh, we act within alliances every time we can, but we should be able to act on ourselves, on our own, every time we have to. All right, well, looking at uh, another very pressing issue, the coronavirus pandemic, there's been a lot of uh, discussion in Europe in recent days about the rollout of vaccines. Uh, it has been slow progress here in France, where there's a lot of vaccine scepticism, the most in Europe, in fact. Uh, are you confident that France actually can uh, vaccinate the 60 to 70 percent of the population that scientists say is needed for herd immunity? Can that happen and can it happen soon enough? Uh, I am really confident. It started slowly and I was critical. Uh, but now there is really a speeding up, both at the national and at the European level. Uh, we heard also Lavender Lyons saying that she would uh, buy uh, 300 million additional doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. European Union uh, has pre-ordered more than 2 billion doses, mm -hmm. uh, to which France uh, takes part for 200 million doses. So it's mm -hmm. more than what we need. Uh, it's going to be speedy. It's going to be secure, safe. We are building trust in the vaccine. Mm. It's a new pandemic. It's a new vaccine. There was a need uh, to take the uh, necessary time in order to build trust. Mm -hmm. Now we see in the polls that more and more French people are willing to get vaccinated. And that's the first victory. All right, let's talk about Brexit with the couple of minutes we have left. Uh, this agreement reached on December 24th. Bit of a bare bones affair being described as thin by uh, many uh, voices. Uh, there's a deal on trade in goods, of course, but not really very much at all on trade in services, which makes up more than 70% of European GDP. Uh, security arrangements more or less absent as well. In and of this uh, itself, is this deal satisfactory for France or is it just... It's better than no deal. Um, it's damage control. And any sort of uh, partnership agreement after Brexit can only be damage control uh, of the consequences of a decision which makes things more complex and less fruitful in the future than what they were in the past. Now it's time for reality. There are, there are frictions in trade between the UK and the EU, not because we want them, but this was a British government's choice mm. to not only to leave the union, but to leave the single market, to leave the customs union, to refuse the four freedoms, which led to, uh, well, you have goods, but you don't have services. Mm. Uh, there were more talks about fisheries than about financial services. That's a British choice. Mm. And we had to adjust, adjust to this quite strange choice so which was a, made. a British win then, in that case? Uh, I wouldn't say so. Uh, uh, maybe what won is realism. And I'm quite relieved that at the end of the day, all these slogans about sovereignty um, were uh, left behind. And uh, there was some sort of realization, mm -hmm. maybe not sufficient, mm -hmm. that in the current world we have to cooperate, we have to work together. I miss a treaty on security and defense with the UK. It is much needed and I think it's needed on both sides. We are facing the same threats, the same challenges. We have to work together. Well, the, the last ever British European commissioner uh, seems to agree with you, Julian King. He was former security commissioner. He said the deal leaves our security relationship dialed down. Uh, can we actually say that EU citizens and British people are less safe? Uh, we are doing our best. Uh, in the agreement, there is uh, cooperation uh, on judicial matters, on police corporations. There, there, there are a number of standards uh, mm. and principles. We have to make sure that we implement them fully mm. and in good faith. But no real-time access, for example, to no. each other's police databases. That uh, is going to slow down investigations. Well, this is what it means to be a third state. But this impacts on European citizens as well. Uh, there is no doubt, and I will never say that Brexit was a bright idea and a good solution, and especially I would say that I'm not certain that British voters knew 
that it would trigger this sort of consequences. I'm not only blaming uh, the Brexiteers about that. I'm definitely blaming the European Union for not being able in 2016 to explain clearly and as loud as possible what would be the consequences of such a decision. We're looking at your role as a member of the European Parliament, uh, you're playing a key final role perhaps in this Brexit process in terms of the deal. Uh, it's been provisionally applied yes. since January 1st, but it hasn't yet been ratified by the EU Parliament. Um, it's a key legal step, uh, but does the Parliament really have a real say here? I mean, if you and your MEP colleagues find things you don't like, you can't really change them now, can you? Um, it's a question of political responsibility. Do we want to ruin the whole thing and say, well, uh, there should be no deal after all? Uh, I'm pretty certain that we will act responsibly. But to act responsibly, it means that you go through the text. You don't vote it in 24 hours, as it was the case in Westminster. And it was quite surprising to me. Uh, and if you see that things are lacking, or things should be more precise, or should be improved in the future, mm. You say it. You think that MEPs could have a role in modifying the relationship in the future, sure. even though the deal is already in force? Of course, because uh, if we consider that the deal is not perfect, uh, first we will be very careful about its implementation. Mm -hmm. We will monitor the way it is implemented. And in the future, if things are to be improved or to be complemented, uh, we will be actively pleading for an improvement. All right, Natalie Loiseau, that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much for being our guest this week. Thanks to you for watching and stay tuned. In just a few minutes' time, we've got part two of the programme coming up for you.